Welcome to Emerging Civil War. I am Chris Mikowski, and joining me today is author and historian Zach Fry. Zach is a member of our Engaging the Civil War series uh, editorial board. We publish that through Southern Illinois University Press. So uh, delighted to have a member of the ECW community with us that we uh, don't normally get to have with us. Zach, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Delighted, delighted. I, and uh, you know, we were just talking a second ago before we started. That's an impressive library you have behind you there. Yeah, that's uh, like I said a moment ago, one of the great things about this virus, the only great thing about this virus probably is the fact that we all get to show off our libraries, whether you're on CNN or emerging civil war, as the case may be. Lots and lots of books. <laughs> so. Well, I wanted to bring you on today so that we could talk about the latest addition to my library. And it <laughs> happens to be this fantastic book by Zach Fry. Uh, Zachary A. Fry, if I'm wrong <laughs> right. about it, A Republic in the Ranks, Loyalty and Dissent in the Army of the Potomac. Uh, this is brand new from the University of North Carolina Press. And uh, I've got to ask you, first of all, like, what's it like to have a book come out in the middle of virus lockdown? <laughs> um, it's, it, it presents some opportunities um, because ideally lots of folks are stuck at home with nothing better to do than to read more and more Civil War books, of which hopefully mine could be one. Uh, but at the same time, I think it presents some challenges. You know, a lot of bookstores um, not only are closed, but aren't even ordering some of these books at the moment. So, um, uh, you know, it's it was it was really exciting the the thought that you know this book could be on on uh, bookshelves at visitor centers at battlefields and everything. But of course, now those are all closed. So. Um, it's it's some opportunities, but some challenges. That's for sure. <laughs> well, and I absolutely have to recommend this book, Top Notch. Um, I have loved it. It's uh, just a fantastic, fascinating read. Um, and we, you know, I think the stereotype or the generally acknowledged uh, background of the Army of the Potomac is that it's a highly political beast. And you really spend, um, I think, some worthwhile time parsing that out to, to show what that really means. And, and on different levels, it means different things. Um, give me a quick broad overview of, of how you would characterize the Army of the Potomac as a political beast. Yeah, well, it's a, it's, it's a fascinating question. Um, if you're a Civil War historian, it's impossible not to talk about the politics in the Army of the Potomac. Um, so I've always been fascinated by it. I can't recall a time when I wasn't fascinated by the Civil War and more specifically the Union Army in the Eastern Theater. Um, and so it was only natural when I was looking for a project um, for me to write about this. Uh, so I think if you're going to look at the Army of the Potomac as a political institution, um, you have to understand that the, the Civil War was a political education for the men in the ranks. And I wanted to take that approach, sort of a bottom-up approach, um, a bottom-up understanding of the Army's political story, because you were not hurting for books on the Army of the Potomac <laughs> in the Civil <laughs> War community, and we're not hurting for books about how political the high command was, George B. McClellan, uh, Joseph Hooker, George Gordon Meade, and others, intensely political creatures. Um, so I wanted to take a bit of a different tack. And what I found over the course of my research was that, yes, the war was a political education for the average soldier, the common, um, the common Billy Yank um, in, the, in the enlisted ranks, but that the real key to understanding how that happened was to look at the junior officer level, um, where not necessarily a lot of work had been done in terms of investigating the politics of the war. Um, so the junior officers and the field grade officers, the captains, majors, the colonels, um, I found that they were the ones really prodding the soldiers into this political awakening that the war provided. Um, so as the war went on, and as these junior officers continued pushing these soldiers um, in the direction of, of a political um, awakening, the army came to argue pretty vehemently for a standard of loyalty to the Lincoln administration that was um, 
that was pretty remarkable. Um, the Army really capitalized on newspapers and to some extent absentee voting as well um, to really set the terms of debate in the North, to set the terms of political debate um, throughout the North. And again, for me, what makes all this, all this so interesting is the fact that the Army of the Potomac really was, for much of the war, George McClellan's army. And George McClellan was one of the most important Democrats of the 1860s. Um, so it's, it's a, for me, the Army of the Potomac is a political story, is the story of very politically aware young men, or at least young men that become very politically aware, trying to navigate those channels of political loyalty and dissent. And if you're a, um, if you're a Republican in the ranks, you're answering off into a Democratic high command. Uh, and if you're a Democrat in the Army of the Potomac, you're answering to a Republican administration. So it's a very interesting political story to see how it plays out. A lot of stuff there I want to unpack and, and circle back to, but uh, one of the, the early things you said reminds me of the old Tip O'Neill quote, all politics is local. <laughs> and when you talk about looking at uh, not the high command, but those junior officers, um, it reminds me a lot of national politics where we all get excited about the presidential election, but it's local politics that have the biggest impact on our day-to-day -day existence. And when you talk about dealing with those junior grade officers who have that day-to-day -day impact on the men, that's got a, a huge significant impact on that, uh, that, that political education that they go Absolutely. Through. Tell me yeah. a little bit about that dynamic and, and why is it those junior grade officers have such an impact on those men? Well, I think to a large extent, it's because the men really came to trust the junior officers as the war went on. Um, initially, a lot of the junior officers were, um, you know, the white collar men of the community, the leaders of the community, the, the pillars of towns um, throughout the North um, who raised a lot of these units, sometimes out of their own pockets to a large extent, um, and were rewarded for that with commissions. Um, where those men remained in command as the war went on, you know, they, they exerted a lot of influence over the men under their, under their command. Um, oftentimes as the war went on, combat, uh, the rigors of campaigning, all of that stuff would sort of weed out the lesser reliable, um, junior officers and in their place were men who the ranks really respected. Uh, and so I think that's part of why the enlisted men trusted the political advice of junior officers so much. What was also really interesting for me to dig into, though, was the extent to which the junior officers, again, the captains, the majors, the colonels, um, argued their own politics. And so one of the most fascinating um, bits of research that I was able to do was sort of to go around to all the various northern state capitals like Albany and Harrisburg and dig into um, the adjutant general's papers, which sounds really boring, but it's basically uh, the adjutant general was like the gatekeeper for the various governors across the north when it came to actually awarding these commissions to junior officers. And what you find when you dig into these boxes and boxes and boxes of seemingly really boring stuff is that lots of men at the front and lots of folks back home are writing to the governors about the political reliability of this junior officer or that junior officer, you know, saying, oh, he's really devoted to the Constitution if he's a Democrat, or he's really devoted to the, to the administration and to hard war if he's a Republican. Um, and so the junior officers themselves were just sort of steeped in this political environment. Uh, and, and I, I think they did exert a lot of very effective political, um, messaging toward the men in the ranks. Uh, and, and the vote totals for those units really tells the story. I mean, to a large extent, if the captain or the major or the colonel was a Republican, uh, the men under their command tended to vote that way. 
Um, and the letters from the soldiers themselves bear out that those vote totals were in earnest. You know, these were not necessarily manipulated across the board by scheming junior officers, although that didn't happen, of course. Um, but that these soldiers really did come to appreciate the stakes of the war according to what they saw emerging around them in terms of a political consensus in their units. Now, I've got to think that it's a, it could potentially be a tough spot for a junior officer where you are essentially middle management and you've mm -hmm. got people above you that are kind of keeping an eye on things from not just a military perspective, but also from a political perspective. Um, did you run into the to any instances where that became a tough spot where these junior officers might have been um, pressured or persecuted because of their political views from the people who were above them? Absolutely. Um, and again, it happened in both uh, Republican and Democratic instances. Um, so one of, the, uh, one of the really interesting things I got to write about in this book was how the Army of the Potomac emerged in the spring of 1863 as probably um, the, the vanguard of a certain political loyalty to the administration predicated on um, emancipation, to be sure, um, but also um, a staunch understanding of the northern um, population's obligation to support the war through conscription and all that stuff. The Army was championing that stuff. And the Army was really ticked off at the appearance of the anti-war wing of the Democratic Party on the home front, the Copperheads. And so the Army, by and large, in dozens and dozens and dozens of official resolutions, um, just castigated the Copperheads. And they published these things in newspapers all across the North. Uh, and occasionally there were Democrats who disagreed with those resolutions. Um, and they found themselves in a very difficult spot, considering that in the spring of 1863, the commander of the Army of the Potomac was a Republican, or at least a Republican in, um, in every way that mattered, and that was Joseph Hooker. Uh, so that could be difficult for, uh, uh, for Democratic officers. On the flip side, when George Gordon Meade as commander of the Army of the Potomac later in 1863. And Meade is not really one for politics one way or the other. Um, when the high command of the Army of the Potomac starts this almost ludicrous scheme in late 1863 to honor George McClellan, even though he has been dismissed as General uh, as commanding general of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, they concoct this scheme to collect thousands of dollars uh, for a gift for George B. McClellan. And numerous regiments commanded by Republicans in the Army of the Potomac um, lambast, lambast this scheme in newspapers and in letters home and all of this stuff. Uh, they find themselves then uh, at the mercy of Democratic commanders in their own army, at least until it gets back to Washington, what's going on, and then the Lincoln administration puts a stop to it. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was a really difficult spot to be in, um, this sort of, like you said, mid-grade, middle management, junior officer level in the army. We're talking about Zach Fry's book, A Republic in the Ranks, a fantastic new book from the University of North Carolina Press. And uh, you, you talked a few minutes ago about how the resentment within the Army um, uh, about the rise of the Copperhead Movement on the home front. And I think about that winter of 62, 63, following Fredericksburg, following the Mud March. Um, Burnside will finally get replaced by Joe Hooker. Morale in the Army is terrible. And people at home are writing letters to these soldiers thinking, uh, like, oh, this is, this is terrible, this is unjust. And, and you start hearing some of these Copperhead sentiments. And it amazed me that despite the low morale during that time, you get these very angry letters from soldiers writing back home saying, I don't want to hear it. I'm out here uh, in the mud, in the cold, fighting yeah. for, the, for the Union, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick this out. Um, it, to me, a really kind of incredible pushback from the Army toward that political sentiment. 
it was and uh, it was it was pretty frightening to a lot of folks to see what the army was capable of in terms of rhetoric. Um, and I, what I talk about in my book in that chapter is how that's really the first time that the army, um, as a it, more or less as a whole, I mean it is a it is an army wide effort, which is to say um, there are regiments throughout basically every division in the army of the Potomac that subscribe to this effort. Um, to argue against the copperheads. Um, and it's, it's an important moment for the army because for the first time, the soldiers in the ranks are seeing the political implications of what's happening beyond just the front lines. They're seeing what's happening at home and they are alarmed by it. Um, I mean, historians have have quibbled over just how serious the Copperhead threat really was in the spring of 1863. But I think that misses the point as far as the Army of the Potomac is concerned, because the Army very much believed it was a threat. You know, the Army very much believed that this could be the direction this Northern war effort takes. And they were not gonna stand for it. They were livid. And, and, and so the, the resolutions that they pass sort of run the gamut from uh, we vehemently disagree with the anti-war sentiment. You know, that's sort of on the one hand, or on the one, on the one extreme, all the way over to um, the, I think it was the third Pennsylvania Reserves, uh, who in their resolutions say, the only right that we grant to traitors at home is the right to die. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not exactly um, an equivocation on the part of the Army of the Potomac in the spring of 1863 when they see the copper head threat emerge. Now, is there a moment when the political balance within the army shifts to such a point that, that it really is not McClellan's army any longer from a political point of view? Yeah, I, I think 1863, you know, 1863 is the turning point of the Civil War for all sorts of reasons, but especially in terms of the Army of the Potomac's political story, 1863 is the turning point. Um, that anti-Copperhead movement that I was talking about happened under Joseph Hooker. And Hooker, as you well know, Chris, and, and, and as many of your listeners will know, um, did some remarkable things to make the Army of the Potomac, or, or at least to remake it into a much more combat effective fighting force by the spring of 1863. Um, so. By, certainly by, by Chancellorsville, by the time of Chancellorsville, you start to see the Army of the Potomac emerge from Little Mac's shadow. Um, but what really seals the deal, I think, as far as the Army is concerned when it comes to McClellan is the autumn of 1863. Uh, and that's when that Army-wide gift to McClellan, um, that, that, good idea, um, or perhaps not so good idea on the part of the high command was started. And just after that all fizzled, just after the McClellan testimonial all fizzled, um, the gubernatorial elections in the autumn of 1863 came around. Uh, and the two big ones were in Ohio and Pennsylvania. Uh, and in both cases, uh, Democrats in those states were running pretty close to Copperhead candidates. Clement Philandingham in Ohio, who was an out-and-out -out Copperhead, um, and George Woodward in Pennsylvania. And McClellan did something astonishing in the eyes of the Army um, just before Election Day in 1863. He came out and officially endorsed Woodward for governor. And this guy, Woodward, was reviled by the Army for his anti-war stance, uh, and all sorts of other reasons. And a number of, of letters from soldiers in the Army of the Potomac attest to the fact that this was basically their disillusionment moment with George McClellan. Um, they never really considered him that much of a political creature until this moment. Um, and they were horrified to see that. Even, even McClellan's own younger brother, who was an aide uh, on John Sedgwick's staff in the Sixth Corps, wrote to his brother 
in uh, November 1863 that everybody around the camp was pretty well disappointed with the letter he wrote endorsing Woodward. And so I think that was really the watershed moment as far as McClellan's army went um, and the Army of the Potomac. I think two of the, the fall of 62, right after Antietam, and there's talk about, uh, you know, a lot of gossip about whether McClellan's going to get replaced or not. And then once he finally does, there, there are people who are saying, like, we should march on Washington. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and McClellan considers it a little bit before finally saying, no, no, no. Um, but, but to me, it seems like the army could have gone either way at that moment. Mm -hmm. McClellan even recognizes that, yeah, maybe this isn't as, wouldn't be as in the bag for me as I think it would be. Um, because the army's starting to not be his any longer. Yeah, to McClellan's everlasting credit, yeah, he realized that that was that that would have shredded um, every every fabric of the republic were he to do that. Um, I, and I and I really do agree that, that that his leaving of the army was probably his best moment of the war. Mm -hmm. He was uh, just very uh, very gracious about the way he finally made his exit. Mm -hmm. That's right, and that was also a really fun part to write about because. You can't deny, I mean, the, the, the legions of historians and, and generations of historians um, are not at all wrong to say that in 1862, the Army of the Potomac loved and revered George McClellan. They did. And what I talk about in my book is that I think a lot of that love and reverence for McClellan had to do with the fact that as soldiers saw what this war was going to be, saw what was required to uh, to win the war, they thought somewhat naively that McClellan was protecting the war effort from political interference. And whether that was um, interference from the radicals in Washington or um, a weak-willed northern home front, uh, they thought that McClellan had their best interests at heart. Uh, and it was, like I said, it was with some fairly profound disillusionment that they realized he was not protecting them from politics at the end of the day, uh, but that he was very much politically motivated in some of the stuff that he did. So let's follow that narrative arc then before we move on from McClellan. Um, he becomes the Democratic candidate for uh, president in 1864. Uh, how much of this cult of McClellan personality is the Democratic party counting on when they name him to be their candidate and you know assuming that that's going to kind of bring along the army with him. and it, i think that's absolutely part of it uh the democratic party in 1864 is split uh, and they are splintered they have um they don't have a clear path or they don't have a clear understanding of how to get to victory and to some extent, they don't, even, they, they don't even agree on what victory looks like for the Democratic Party in 1864. Um, so McClellan is an obvious nominee because he can capture the soldier vote. But then they'll saddle McClellan with a platform that pronounces the war a failure and a vice presidential candidate in George Pendleton, who was probably only the second most egregious copperhead in the country behind the landing. <laughs> So the soldiers were not altogether thrilled with that prospect either. That's not to say that McClellan didn't have his, um, his, his followers in the army. Even by late 1864, he did. And one of the more surprising things I found over the course of my research was that by November 1864, the staunchest McClellan defenders remaining in the army um, were the soldiers probably who had been in the war effort the least amount of time. Uh, so the soldiers who had actually fought under McClellan in 1862 um, were not altogether sold on McClellan as a candidate. Uh, there were some exceptions like the Irish Brigade, um, other democratic strongholds like units from Philadelphia perhaps. Uh, but by and large, the soldiers who had been in the war the longest, fought the war the hardest, um, had rejected McClellan for president. Now, one of the things I really like about your book, um, you know, we're talking about this narrative arc of McClellan 
from general to president, the presidential candidate. Um, and, and it's hard not to talk about army politics without talking about McClellan. But one of the things I really love about the book is, is this um, bottom-up approach that also has a narrative arc where you talk about these soldiers who come to the army who are maybe completely apolitical. Um, mm -hmm. They've come from, you know, the boondocks or, or non-political areas and they get this political education and the army becomes a very political entity as a result. Um, where do you see kind of the, the tipping point of that narrative arc that really kind of turns the lower ranks into a political beast? Um, I think the army becomes much more political, like I said, by, by certainly by early 1863. Uh, but there are glimmers of it beforehand. I mean, when you see the frustration that the average soldier experiences on the peninsula, uh, for instance, in mid-1862. I mean, th these soldiers are, are seeing what slavery actually looks like firsthand. Um, they're seeing what the Southern oligarchy, the aristocracy, the slaveocracy, if, as they would call it, looks like firsthand. Their eyes pop when they see Southern plantations. Um, and especially after the defeat uh, in the seven days, they're finding that this war is going to be much harder, uh, much more difficult than they had originally thought. Uh, and they're looking for more commitment from the northern home front. And it's not necessarily forthcoming in the summer of 1862. Uh, and so I think that that's sort of the, uh, the foundation of the soldier's political sentiment, this, this idea in the middle of 1862 um, that things shouldn't be going this way. You know, the war should be easier than this. We should be winning this. Um, we have the resources. We have the men. We have the general, to a large extent. We should be winning this. Um, and so that frustration, I think, really leads uh, the Army pretty naturally to an anti-copperhead approach um, in early 1863. Uh, and then you sort of see the... The, the maturation of that idea as the war goes on. But yeah, I think it really starts in, in mid 62. They, they, the army certainly flexes its political muscle in the election of 64. Um, how important was that as a moment? Do you think? That's a great question. And it's, it's pretty staggering to think that the field army commanded by um, it, it, commanded by George McClellan, uh, one of the most important figures in the Republic at the time, uh, that that field army rejected its commander uh, in this election. And if you look at what the, you know, the range of possibilities were to a Northern voter in 1864, um, it's, it's pretty clear that McClellan offers a candidacy that is not necessarily, I mean, Northern victory in the war is, is not a foregone conclusion if McClellan wins. There's probably going to be a patched up peace. Uh, emancipation is probably going to be back on the bargaining table as, as something that could, um, that could go. Uh, and a lot of the gains that the Union Army has made are going to be given up. At least that's how Northern soldiers perceive it. And, and I think to a large extent, they're, they're right to perceive it that way. Um, so I think it's an incredibly important moment um, for all sorts of reasons. I mean, my gosh, we held a presidential election in the middle of a civil war in which um, a, a field army commander beloved by his soldiers, an army that may have followed him to Washington in November 1862 to overthrow the administration. Um, you know, that that guy is now being rejected by that army. It's a tremendous story. We're talking with Zach Fry, author of Republic in the Ranks. He's an associate or assistant professor of military history at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. And uh, Zach, I want to ask you, like, so the, the soldiers get this political education in the army. The war finally ends. What do these men do with this newfound political awareness once it's time to go home? Yeah, and, and that, was, that was one of the most interesting parts of this book to write about. Um, I'm probably not done with that topic. Um, it's just so interesting to think about you know, these guys were 21, 22, 23 
um, their, you know, their adult lives are just starting um, when they gain this political awareness, they go home. And we think of soldiers oftentimes sort of going home and going into what, what one historian called hibernation as far as thinking about the war went. Uh, you know, they were eager to get home. They were eager to put the war behind them. They didn't want to have to, they didn't want to have to deal with the, the demons of the war that they had lived through. Uh, so they went back to their daily lives. And what I found was quite the opposite. Um, if you look through the newspapers, because that's, that's, that's one problem with it. The source base goes away. <laughs> the letters <laughs> go away when the soldiers go home. So it's, it's not exactly easy to track what their daily life is like once they, once they get back home and, you know, get married and start having kids and everything. Um, but according to the newspaper, some of which are intensely partisan, but that's just the nature of the beast, um, you see veterans organizations pop up across the North beginning in late 1865, early 1866. Uh, and these are veterans organizations that begin by their very nature for political reasons. One of them, the Soldiers and Sailors National Union League, um, starts in Washington, D.C. A veteran of the 13th Massachusetts starts it, um, grows to a few thousand members in Washington, D.C. Uh, they are denouncing the Andrew Johnson administration for all that Johnson has done to basically sell off the gains that they have bought with their blood in the war. And one of the most remarkable resolutions I found from any soldiers or veterans in this case, were this uh, veterans of this soldiers league, many of them Army of the Potomac, calling for Robert E. Lee to be charged with treason and hanged. Um, and these sorts of organizations pop up like uh, the Boys in Blue uh, is a big organization that pops up throughout the East Coast and the big cities, Philadelphia, New York, and the like. Um, and you see in these sort of the, the beginning of the Grand Army, the Republic, and the Republican interest group um, that would come to dominate so much of national politics by the late 19th century. That's not to say that there weren't Democratic groups. There were. There really were. Um, and they were very, uh, very vehement in their own denunciations of politicians on the other side of the aisle. Um, but it was a very, it was a very heated political environment in Reconstruction, and the soldiers were a big part of that. So before we wrap up, uh, is there anything I haven't asked you about the book that you want to make sure you get in for listeners? Uh, just that it's 40% off right now on uncpress.org. <laughs> <So> that's, <laughs> that's the only one. Um, no, this is, this has been wonderful. It's, it's, you know, this book was many years in the making. And um, one of the funny things I'm sure you know, Chris, is by the time you get a book done, it's sort of in your rear view mirror. Um, and you're right. like, oh, I finally got this thing done. Um, so now that I look at it again with, with fresh eyes, it's a lot of fun to talk about it. So I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, sure. A great book to read. Again, I want to highly recommend it. A rub public in the ranks. Um, I did a Q&A with Zach on the blog. I'm going to post the link for that here in the comments section so you can find out a little bit more. Um, I was particularly fond of the title and, and what a great metaphor it was. So I'll, I'll ask people to go and look at the Q&A there on the blog to, uh, to learn more about that. Zach, what a real treat to chat with you. And I really appreciate the chance to just explore this a little bit more. Fascinating, fascinating topic. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. Oh, my privilege. So I'm Chris Mikowski for Emerging Civil War. On behalf of Zach Fry, thanks for joining us. We will see you online and on the battlefield.